Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Business in Hawaii program. My name is Kathleen Lee. I am the founder of Kathleen Lee Consulting. I'm also a PR consultant and a video journalist. In today's segment, we are going to be talking about business and community collaboration during COVID-19. Um, today's guest is a dynamic individual who is the embodiment of her name and a good friend of mine. And she is, among many things, the associate editor and a staff writer for the Phil M. Courier, um, Hawaii's longest running Filipino American publication. So I'd like to welcome to the show Radiant Cordero. Hey, Radiant. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Think Tech Hawaii, as well as Kathleen, for having me on here. I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. Great. Okay, so let's let's start off. Let's tell the people out there a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your background, um, your experiences in both the public and private sectors, as well as your community involvement. Absolutely. Well, hey everyone. Again, my name is Radiant Cordero, and as Kathleen mentioned, I do work in our local journalism, uh, specifically in the Filipino community. I have um, written for. The, a local newspaper called the Philam Courier. It is the longest running and leading publication in the state of Hawaii. And um, it's actually runs in my blood. So my mom began a business, you know, doing um, business cards and doing and serving our community in different ways, such as, you know, it was actually a a Sari Sari store, which is like a little convenience store in Kalihi, and um, added doing business cards as well as making a making um you know souvenir books, and then um, it kind of flourished into doing a newspaper, you know, serving our community because we have to recognize that um, you know as as our community grows. Our community still has different avenues of how to be reached out to and newspaper is not dead and that's what i feel you know newspaper and different ways of communicating radio is not dead and so um the film career fosters that the film career is a multimedia um platform we are on um we live stream as well as on the radio. And so I, um, although it's on hiatus at the moment to do uh, a little more venturing into other platforms um, is, uh, is on hiatus right now. It was called the Philippine X Collective, highlighting stories and especially uh, young Filipino, Filipina and Filipino and Filipina entrepreneurs in our um, community here, whether they are here on the island or they are now on um, the mainland. Nonetheless, um, so that's what the Philam Courier is and what the Philam Courier has stemmed from and what, you know, my family has built the Philam Courier to be is building a community and supporting our community. And so um, when we talk about a re in relation to um, COVID-19, um, it's, it's no different from um, that support or building of a community or uplifting of a community. So that, so you said that community runs in your blood, which leads me to our next question. Um, like I mentioned in your introduction, the Phil M. Courier is one of the many, many, many hats and yeah. that you wear and things that you do. You're also running for um, city and county of Honolulu City Council um, for District 7. Sorry, I kind of stumbled onto that, but you are running for District 7 for City Council. And tell us yeah. what uh, motivated you to make this decision. Absolutely. So Kathleen, like I mentioned um, earlier, there was um, the impetus for the courier itself was um, to build on community. And because I grew up in that in that type of environment and that with that, um, I just drive, I guess, community driven efforts. Um, that's how I started my, my service as. So, you know, I, during high school, even I started working right away I, and I was volunteering as much as I could while in high school. Um, but, you know, I graduated high school in 2008 when we, when the market crashed, um, you know, the newspaper was a free newspaper. We could barely sustain ourselves. Um, we had actually two newspapers in one. It was one was a, a Philippine business type of a newspaper, but that folded. Um, so I stayed home for college and I, you know, worked extremely hard. I worked about three, four, five jobs even to basically survive. Um, 
through college. Yeah. So, um, and growing up, I, I grew up in Kalihi and I experienced, you know, public transportation. Um, I grew up with a village, you know, supporting our, our, our family and the newspaper and community. And that's how it was. And that's so for what I wanted to do, um, to continue to support the community, I entered, um, the nonprofit world, working for nonprofits. Okay. And um, I did that for, uh, you know, working with persons who feel like they don't always have a voice, um, who feel underserved a lot of the times. So I wanted to be someone who could be their cheerleader. And I was their cheerleader for, you know, persons with disabilities who, you know, sought jobs or employment opportunities. And a lot of the times, uh, for whatever reason they were unable to retain their jobs or they were unable to get those skills so i was able to play a little role in that you know um and then i also worked with uh, our keiki and during that time um i actually had to uh take take on more of it when the furlough when furlough fridays were occurring um in the early 2000s or like you know 10 11 so, or so years ago and um during that time, I was still going to college um, and still actually with my professors, either um, doing action or pro not, pro not protesting, but, you know, protesting or doing action and writing letters um, to our state legislature. And with that, I actually, um, in alignment with my, with my, um, with my degrees, which was political science, American studies. I was actually trying to get um, my degree in ethnic studies, but I was just about two credits or two classes shy. And I, for me, I couldn't, I couldn't continue. I, for all the jobs that I was working, it was very difficult to make a decision to continue schooling for another semester, you know? So I was also in ethnic studies and um, I wanted to make sure that I could get my credits done. So I saw an opportunity to intern at the state legislature. Wow. And then I saw how I, I just, I had a quick glimpse of what can be done. You know, then I came back for another session. And then, you know, the more that you're in there, you can, you have more opportunity to do outreach to your community. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted, I, I felt like, um, these people are sitting here making decisions on things that people outside who are people who are with me waiting at the bus stop, waiting on the, um, in the bus or, you know, on the bus with me right. or people just down the street. And how can we include them in that process? So that has always been my goal, um, in any, in anything. So starting from nonprofits, collaborating with, um, schools, collaborating with, uh, with, private companies, even like Metal Gold or other companies to put on programs because nonprofits have, have their role, businesses have their role, government has its role. But what happens if we can use all those strengths and marrying it, marry it together, you know? Um, magic happens, basically. And, and that's, that's, that's what I've seen, um, you know, for me, it was never, uh, never, I never doubted that because I've seen that through my, through my family. And through and my family's um, newspaper and the community that they've built. Um, so after that, um, after working in nonprofits, I of course had to um, continue working. So I worked at, in hotels. I worked at Royal Hawaiian and Sheraton Waikiki, and then um, I was wavering or not wh whether or not to continue and to serve our local government. Um, so I then continued after, um, the nonprofits to, to join the city council, um, as a staff member, um, uh, doing, um, doing commu communications as well as, you know, con constituent concerns. And, um, I felt like I, I personally really didn't know what the council does or what the city and county's role was in our lives. And I actually found myself taking a liking to it. I gotta say, it also took a while to get used to. I was so used to how the state legislature operates. I was so, so, I was so used to like that, that four or five months of, or right. even seven months. Right, different systems, right. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, the first, the first three years of working at the council, I was like, oh, I don't have the stamina for this, <laughs> but um, I'm just kidding. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a different beast in the, in the council. Um, you know, year round beyond that, but just the different rules, how it operates, the different um, ABCs that we have for our city agencies. But, um, you know, 
I think in my position uh, from my experience at the state legislature, also in nonprofits, as well as in journalism, you know, wanting to highlight people's stories, but also their concerns and issues is to also um, utilize all that and fight for their resources, fight for um, the, um, yeah, the issues that they feel like have not been elevated. And so I hope that I can do that. And um, yeah, so, so I hope I can do that. And if you have any more questions on that too, I would love to share. Yeah, well, let, let's, let's, let's move into um, the next, oh, on that topic, you know, since you have seen um, a lot of uh, things going on in different sectors, uh, what have you seen and observed so far as new significant issues that businesses and our local government are running into with the COVID-19 pandemic? So right off hand, um, our, our local, um, our small mom and pop shops from the beginning, they really didn't know how to operate when um, a lot of these times, information is shared through the press conferences and then after the news, and then if not, it's explained through the executive orders and whatnot. But a lot of the time, you know, Kathleen, and you know, everyone who's watching here, we are so caught up in trying to just live our lives. And because we are so caught up trying to live our lives, um, the resources that are given to us are not always um, fit for our I don't want to say understanding, but for what we have time for, what we have, um, um, you know, just how we can accommodate. So because some people or, or many businesses were unable to either accommodate or whether to provide assistance for um, their, their employees, we saw that there were major um, hindrances. Hindrances being, being like, um, you know, when so an employee applies for unemployment versus when their business or their former employer helps them do it, you can see that um, the system doesn't check whether or not it's the same and that hinders our businesses as well as um, their employees to get the assistance that they need like funding or unemployment checks or yeah. PPP um, and those little those little systematic um, I guess discrepancies do make a huge difference because it means having to reapply again, having to spend hours or days even to keep doing calls to make the changes at the at the uh, call center, you know, or to DLIR or whether it be um, um, DCCA for businesses. Um, I'll also, I also noticed that our, a lot of our businesses are considered, you know, whether they have um, the amount of, of staff that they have. Some of them were told to apply for PPP. Some of them were, were told to apply for, you know, disaster relief. Others were, applied, were told to apply for, you know, other things. So um, recognizing that there was that type of a discrepancy as well. So in the very beginning, um, we, I got a lot of calls trying to help them get information on whether or not did I apply for the right one? I know it went through, but am I wasting my time waiting to be approved for PPP or disaster or small business disaster relief um, funds? And so that's that's what's hard. Um, I think has hit hit a lot of people hard. It's just all the information, but how do I know what what fits right for my business? What fits right for um, me as an employee who lost their job, or me as someone who is an independent contractor because a lot of people in the very beginning who were independent contractors very well applied for unemployment insurance, you know, because they too lost their income, but did a lot of us, a lot of them didn't know that, um, that these gigs or side um, jobs were unable to be, um, I guess, yeah, funded through unemployment insurance. And that's just um, ways that we can, work better towards. I think it can come forward from not just government, but a lot of the communications that we are allotted, whether it be through the news stations, through newspaper, but also how 
we all share information and we have to be super, super cognizant of that. Yeah. And I really implore everyone to be cognizant of, of how different people communicate and not just how they communicate, but how they receive information. Because I can be, me and Kathleen, I can be talking, but let's say someone who's on the outside is like, you guys are talking alien to me, you know? So um, yeah, just really being cognizant of that. Yeah, okay, so let's go off on that, that note then. You kind of touched upon it already, um, but what are the lessons that you think we can take away from the community's response to the pandemic? So what we can take away from our community's response to the pandemic is that, you know, actually a lot of people were very, were abiding by it, by a lot of it, but because they didn't know where to seek or they got lack of responses or they um, just, there was just a lot of miscommunication. I think what the community can take away from it is um, working, allowing for their, their opinions and their ideas to come forward in the beginning, as opposed to, um, as opposed to just waiting for, things to get really bad and say, hey, you know, back in March, I was unable to do this. Back in April, this happened. And now we have to do to play catch up, you know, but it's also on the, the community. And I know um, many people have said this before, but to also um, speak up and say, hey, we need help understanding this. Hey, we need help um, for clarification on certain things. And I don't want to say just our community. I want to also say our um, nonprofit organizations, our, our faith-based communities, also for our um, businesses, as well as our government agencies, because with as much of information overload that is going on, it really leads, leaves it up for everyone's interpretation, you know? So um, I think that together we can form a, an easier and better system, hopefully in the future, whether or not it's a pandemic, but something else, even, even for natural disasters, even for, um, even ju just for any other things that it's mass amounts of information for, for everyone. And, you know, even for, I want to say for the, for natural disasters, even with the Hawaii Red Cross and how many shelters there are, because there are so many, so many documents from last years or prior years. And I can say, you know, for me, so as someone who wants to get information out there ASAP, you know, um, and so many people either contacting us right away, like, hey, can you clarify this? Um, if we don't get information right away, we, we are utilizing information that's outdated too. You know what I mean? So being sure that we're sharing the right factual, accurate information as well. Okay, and, and that kind of goes into my next question. You're, you've been really good at this. <laughs> like the next question that I'm thinking is like, you've already responded to it. And I think that is so wonderful. Um, and so what are some ideas um, that you have on how local businesses and the community um, can all work together to move forward from COVID-19? That's, that's a great question. And the first thing that I thought of when you asked that question was, you know, a lot of businesses, a lot of organizations, we're used to, whether or not we say it or not, we're used to competing, yeah? We're used to competing for resources, for grants and aids, for nonprofits, because you know, uh, I used to work in nonprofits and having to apply for grants and all that and making our case. But honestly, um, when we are in this type of a, uh, of a time, of a, a period in time, we have to find ways to be collaborative in a way where um, if government is doing one, one um, how do I say, if government is doing one type of work and then seven nonprofits and then two businesses want to do the very same thing. I think what's really good is to collaborate in by, I want to say certain areas, you know, like if we were to just think about Ahupua'as, if I could just make it a, a simple example. If we think about, um, let's say I'm in Moanalua Ahupua, for example. And if we think of all the businesses here and all the schools here and they have different plans, I think it, and I don't know who it could be, if it could be a business or it could be government or, or whatnot, but I think 
having a centralized area of, of like where all the information is, but also um, coordinating with people because there are times where people just down the road and um, I don't know, like for example, like for something that's happening down by Aloha Stadium, and then the nonprofit organizations just down the road um, don't know, they they are doing food distribution or meal daily meals, um, you know, on the daily, and then so if they don't know about it, it kind of interrupts their their daily service and also um, interrupts like who is showing up to their meals. So it then kind of um, one they might waste food. To um, people who are trying to get to the nonprofits have a hard time to to get there to begin with because of what's happening. So I think um, being able to just I don't want I keep saying communicate it, but really it's just need a needing a centralized area and not feeling like we're competing on doing our on providing these services. You know what I mean? So if you. We, and if we get out of that competitive like my business mindset, especially during this time, I think we have a huge opportunity because we've seen it already. So many businesses, so many nonprofits, so much of our government agencies have hooied together to um, to do public private partnership, do faith based and and business partnerships to really serve our community. And we can see how that works out. And that's and we can see that. And honestly, I just want to continue that, continuing that, but also just making sure it's streamlined so that, you know, people know what's going on, you know, <laughs> they won't run into the traffic or they won't run into um, any other issues or duplication. And also it makes it easier for when um, different people are, are looking for different resources. Like I said, um, so many of my neighbors are asking me, hey, do you have um, any information on food distribution or et cetera? And sometimes, of course, I go right to the Hawaii Food Bank, which is an amazing resource, but there's also so many other churches that are doing great things like senior food boxes or even other um, like unions as well as uh, businesses who are partnering with other groups to do it. But how do I find out, you know, it just, it would be so much easier to share to information share when it's all streamlined and i think i think um i know that's not a real idea uh, like a new idea about that but i think a a resource could come from you know right now they say that tourism is 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 um is you know not not existent right now so maybe if we can utilize the great um resources and abilities that um I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't wanna say that they should do this, but I'm just thinking um, what agencies are really good at collating information, which agencies have really great, beautiful design. And I'm thinking, you know, okay, or our tourism agencies, you know, they can collate information, they can um, stre streamline it, and it doesn't matter who it is, uh, if it's from government, from city, state, county, and on which islands, they all, they, that, that agency has hands in all of our, counties. So being able to find that one sweet spot um, agency or umbrella organization or business that can um, provide um, a streamlined service. And, and if it's our media, so be it, you know, of course, I being a being someone who's a writer, and also in, uh, in radio before, I'm very much, I'm very much biased towards that, of course, but, you know, um, very much so bringing all those resources and strengths together, together, but we need that streamline for sure. That's awesome. Um, okay, so you are, you did talk about, um, well, you talk a lot about your passion, which is awesome, as well as clear communication. So <laughs> well, we'll go over what I, let's go over the last question um, that I would love to ask you, and I would love people to know is that based on everything that you've said and what you are planning to do now, which is to continue serving the community, but in the capacity of someone who is running for office, what are your priorities? Oh, absolutely. Well, I don't know if you could tell, but community engagement is one of my top, uh, top priorities. But, you know, I was actually speaking to a few neighbors that, you know, community driven and community led efforts um, to, towards solutions because, and I tell people this all the time, like, I feel like, um, not not just our neighbors but our youth have solutions to a lot of our issues and um a lot of them they grow up 
and I got to say, I grew up feeling like these decisions were not made for my community. And so I want to make, make that change. I want to see that when communities are impacted, that they were part of the deciding factor. And I feel like with my collaborative experiences through nonprofit, as well as um, in journalism, but also just in volunteering in general, um, I really want to bring that forth. Um, next up is, um, of course, I, I would not be speaking um, about anything COVID related right now if we don't address economic recovery and redevelop, not redevelop, development. Um, but I wanna um, focus on the strengths of each community in itself. For me, I also don't really like blanket um, approaches to, um, to certain neighborhoods and certain um, areas because I feel like one thing that will work for, you know, IEA might not very much work for something in Chinatown because they all lead different, lead different lives. Have um, they? They do have parking problems. They both have parking problems, but their 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 issues are quite different if you think about it. So um, with that, um, with with the different, um, I want to say neighborhood, neighbor to neighbor, or neighborhood or town driven, um, you know, each town's driven. Uh, purpose and to build its own economy back and using the, its own um, knowledge to, to do that. So whether or not it's to support local uh, residents, um, but they're small businesses. So for Kalihi, like, you know, there's a lot of people who have, there's a lot of warehouse business, businesses, but in Kamaki, there's a lot of businesses that are storefronts, you know what I mean? So really approaching it um, in a manner that is good for them, not good for them, but um that is, that fits them, I should say. And a lot of that is also looking to other economies that beyond our tourism economies, but also what the strengths of our neighbors are. Um, I really love, um, I, so I grew up in Kalihi and I live in Salt Lake now and um, a lot of urban gardening happening, you know, and a lot of, um, a lot of community gardening, you know, sharing of, of food. So if we want to look at our food security and look at how we can um, just create a sustainable local economy, we don't have to look just to our rural areas. We don't have to look just to um, our other islands. How about we look towards our neighbors, even in our urban settings? So um, also public health and safety along with that. Um, access to healthcare, access to, um, you know, emergency response systems, making sure that even beyond pandemics, even in, even in, um, during tsunamis or hurricane season, right. mapping out, right, uh, defining mapped evacuation systems. I, you know, I don't even know where those are, the flood zones. And speaking of floods, um, my top, my number one top priority is taking care of our found, the foundation of our city core services, which is our infrastructure. And infrastructure even means like our technology to our sewer system, to our water and to our sidewalks and everything that we use and how we even communicate with, um, with, the rest of the um our neighbors on in the county right. so that's what i feel infrastructure is i like that so. i love how you outlined all that um and on that note again we we thank you for sharing um your ideas and your passion with us i'm kathleen lee with our guest today radiant cordero again um staff writer for the bill I'm courier and associate editor as well as a candidate for a city council district seven so thank you for joining us. Um, you can catch this video on thinktechhawaii.com as well as ThinkTechHawaii's YouTube. So thank you again, Radiant, and thanks everyone for watching. Bye, everyone. Stay safe.